Hey everybody, we're here with Tyler Herring from Prince. Tyler, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, just wanted to sit down with you today and uh, give you the opportunity to kind of tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so let's kind of start from the beginning. So where did, where did you grow up? The beginning, goodness gracious. Um, no, going way back. I grew up actually on the north side of Chicago. So a little town called Grays Lake, um, about an hour north of the city. So nice, nice, quiet little suburb there. Um, pretty, pretty straightforward upbringing. Actually, um, tennis didn't become a part of my life growing up until probably a little bit later than most. So I, tennis didn't really start for me until I started high school. So I'm not your typical played in the junior, started when I was six. You know, that was just never me. I was a soccer and a basketball player forever. My, my best friend in high school ultimately, like, begged me to to try out for the tennis team it just so happened that i was much better at tennis than i was at anything else so um yeah so grew up there um after after high school ended up at the the university of illinois um fighting illini down there in champaign um through a couple you know lucky turns of fate ended up getting involved with the the men's tennis team there uh, at the university of illinois um, ended up traveling with that team uh, for the better part of four years, um, worked with that team on their gear, did a lot of stringing, um, was the first um, person ever in the program history who was put on scholarship to basically manage the team and their, their equipment. So traveled all the away matches, um, did all that unbelievable experience for me, getting to know, you know, Craig Tiley, who was the head coach at the time, and, you know, a lot of those players who've gone on to do you know, pretty, pretty spectacular things. And ultimately that, that relationship with the universal noise, what, what ended me uh, at Prince because our coach, Craig Tiley um, was a, was a huge Prince supporter and uh, our local promotion rep, a woman by the name of Peg Connor uh, ended up, I uh, met her for the first time, actually the night we won the national championship in Athens, Georgia. I remember about five words of maybe speaking to Peg that night. I was, I was a few drinks deep after winning the national championship uh, over Vanderbilt, but um, yeah, that's a sort of a, a weird winding path. I never really thought I was going to get into tennis, didn't go to college for tennis, ended up getting involved in tennis sort of secondhand, always had a love for gear, for rackets, um, all that stuff. And lo and behold, I'm sitting here now kind of doing my dream job. Um, for, for lack of a better description, um, you know, getting to run a brand and being involved in product development every day is something I've always wanted to do ever since I really sunk my teeth into the sport um, in college. That's pretty wild. I mean, I, I, and probably more evidence for a lot of the studies that are coming out now that you really should not just be specializing in one sport. You should have a, you should have a background in multiple sports. That's, that's kind of amazing to have uh, yeah. you know a lot of success in tennis being relatively late to the game is my absolute last option soccer first then ultimately basketball um those are my two sports and ended up picking up tennis late and i mean look what happens that's wonderful great. thing that's awesome that's awesome i didn't know that so could you tell us a little bit about you kind of alluded to your role at prince could you tell us um, about your title and uh and what your day-to-day -day is like with yeah prince? so um my official title now is I'm a vice president at the Authentic Brands Group. Um, that is the company that owns the Prince brand. So my my role within ABG, um, I'm part of the brand team there. And, and our job is we're primarily a license-based business, um, but with one caveat. So unlike most traditional licensing businesses, um, the Prince team within ABG, we still own and operate all of the product development. So I oversee pretty much all operations uh, relative to the Brins brand under ABG. Uh, I manage the relationships with all of our global operators and licensee partners around the world. I think to date we have something like 20, 20 just under 30 um, partners uh, around the world that, that operate in just about every major tennis market uh, on the planet. So that's, that's primarily my job now, but I've had, you know, prior to this, just about every position 
um, and every tier <laughs> along the way uh, in the organization. Um, prior to my current role, I was the global director of uh, R&D and product development. Um, before that, I was the global product manager for performance rackets. Before that, um, strings and accessories. Um, before that, I started my product development job um, launching the Prince 5000 string machine. So that was my first first time they gave you know me as an eager 20 something an opportunity to make my parlay into the product team. And before that, um, I actually started my career as a as a tech rep for Prince. So. I followed Ken Merritt, my mentor at the time, around the country for the better part of two years doing, oh my God, more clinics and more. We had just launched O3 and I spent the first year and a half doing nothing but demo days and clinics from Dubai to Southern California. It was a lot of miles. but So I've seen just about everything um, position-wise. I managed the sponsor juniors for a while. Trying to think if there's anything else interesting that I did. I'm sure a little bit of everything. I can think of one really interesting thing you did. Okay. It took place in, in New Jersey. Um, I don't know if you remember this. There was a certain guy that you interviewed. For a oh, position. was it you? Was it you? <laughs> That's right. I think I did interview for a position. Yep. Too uh, funny. Is that the first time we met, bitch? That was the first time we met in person. I think we had kind of corresponded on product development stuff. A couple of times because I had right. um, I had uh, done some stuff with Dave Milanowski and oh, that's uh, right. Dave and, and Steve Davis, and then that transferred over to you too. Play tester extraordinaire. It was fun. Case. I love that stuff. <laughs> so it's kind of wild. I mean, you, you you talked a lot about in your history, and you talked a lot in, in your you know professional history as well. Um, you've been doing this for a while. You've had a number of different roles in the industry, a number of diff different uh, responsibilities. What keeps you motivated? <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, it, I mean, it sounds cliche, but I've always, um, I've, I've always just liked learning how to do new stuff. You know what I mean? And, you know, I, there's just something that, that I've always liked doing is just, I'm a problem solver. So I was an engineer, you know, kind of by trade. Um, I ended up getting a little bit more involved in business toward the end of my college career. But like, ultimately, what I've always enjoyed doing is like solving puzzles, right? Like kind of so problem solving, generally speaking. So, you know, when I got involved in, in prints, it's like the first set of challenges was, okay, I have to figure out how to be a better presenter, a better speaker. How do I engage a group of people? How do I shift my tone and, and capture the attention of a, you know, a, a nine to 11 ladies clinic, you know, and how do I shift gears into a junior clinic that's right after school? And how do I shift that energy into, you know, uh, an after work nighttime evening clinic? And so I learned, you know, for me, those first couple of years was all about honing my voice, right, which I think ultimately served me really well. And then from there, when I finally did get an opportunity to move into other things like player development, you know, it was all about, well, man, how do we find the right kids? What am I looking for? You know, who can I, who can I, you know, get close to and, you know, absorb as much information, whether that be, you know, the Ken Merritt's or the Steve Davis's of the world. And, you know, fortunate for me, I was surrounded by unbelievably talented people when I started, you know, like the, the, the like just the foundation of tennis industry type of people. Um, who just had a love for what they did and they were just so kind and gracious to you know put up with all my incessant questions <laughs> and, and actually answer them whenever they could and they gave me a lot of rope as well to go out and you know make mistakes and learn and you know so from recruiting and my god when i got into product stuff i had one of the best mentors anybody could possibly hope for and, and steve davis who's got to be on the mount rushmore of of tennis engineers and impact to the sport. So getting to work with him for God, I remember how many years was, was pretty miraculous. So it's hard to get bored, right? If problem solving is what you love to do and you, know, you have a passion for tennis and you love product I and mean, like what, what better situation could you ask for? I mean, I wasn't bored a single day since I started, you know, at Prince. So I've been, I've been pretty fortunate uh, in that regard. Nice. So, Aside from the problem solving, what 
what do you think is your favorite part about working in the tennis industry in particular? Mm -hmm. Because you can probably solve it anywhere. You can't, I mean, there's something about, like, listen, we we say all the time, like, there's no such thing as a tennis emergency, right? Meaning it's not a life and death situation. Like, at the end, if we're doing our jobs well, I get to participate in somebody's happiness, right? So being involved in a game and a sport while still being able to, you know, feel that sense of fulfillment um, in terms of my professional desires, like it's sort of the best of both worlds. Like I've, you know, as part of my role at ABG, I I now wear a few different hats that are maybe atypical for, you know, traditional operating brands. And that's, that's certainly fun. Like I've got to, to learn a lot of things, um, about a different style of business and that's certainly motivating, but you realize pretty quickly that that isn't quite the same as, you know, getting to have a say in making a product that you get to put in somebody's hands and watch them experience. Right. And when you get it right, when you get that kind of beautiful mix of thoughtfulness, design, performance, and then ultimately you get to watch somebody have, the result you intended them to have with a particular product, you know, it's different. It's not like advertising. It's not like traditional marketing where you come up with an idea and you hope that you, you know, you you don't get to see how people react to an ad if you put something out there, right? But I've had the unique opportunity to physically put a racket in somebody's hand and watch them have an experience with it. And I think that's why you know, tennis and maybe sports generally, but tennis specifically is so fun. Like I, if I ever look to do anything outside of tennis, I think I would still want to be in sports in some way or in some sort of field that gave me that kind of connection with the end user or with the consumer. You, you said in that answer, I mean, just a really awesome phrase, which is just to participate in someone's happiness. Yeah. And I mean, I think yeah. that's an, I think that's an incredible phrase. And uh, I think a lot of people kind of, I think you summed up in, in that phrase kind of what a lot of people, you know, really enjoy most in life. I, that's, that's sure. how I feel as a tennis coach. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's the most rewarding part for me. So absolutely, I'm stealing that, man. That was, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, yeah. So now that we talked about all the warm and fuzzy stuff, what what would be if you could change one thing about the tennis industry, the tennis world? What would it be? Ah, uh, you know, I I feel like the mm-hmm. the one thing the tennis industry has doesn't have going for it is it it tends to have a legacy mindset. Um, that being that, I think that the nature of the sport because it has such deep roots, it's such a it's a lifetime sport. It's it's not like a fast, it's, it's not something that's just popped up in the last few years. And unfortunately, I think the industry oftentimes doesn't act as if it's part of the 2020 year that we're living in, right? And I think one of the biggest challenges I noticed throughout my time at Prince is, you know, I've, I've, I've had both the, the misfortune and the fortune of seeing both the good and the bad of, of what happens when you don't rethink the way you look at the business and you know it, it's odd because we don't look at our we as as individuals mitch and tyler like we're consumers if we were going to go buy a pair of shoes or we were going to go buy a new phone or we were going to go buy a new car our expectations about how brands communicate with us talk to us present to us we have certain expectations right but sometimes when we sit in the tennis industry and we put our tennis industry hat on, we forget all of those things. You know, we don't, we, we, we think about, you know, it's a wholesale business and not really a retail direct business. So a lot of times we are not speaking directly to the customer as much as we should, right? We've given up that responsibility to our retailers and they're a critical part of the, the program without question. But I would love to see the industry get a little bit more consumer facing, a little bit more consumer direct with the way they communicate, the way that they talk beyond just kind of the platitudes. So I think, I think we'll see in the next few years, I mean, especially now given the environment that we're in, uh, you know, there's, 
if there was ever a time to to rethink your go to market and rethink your channels and rethink how you go to market this time that we're in is going to force people to be more efficient to think differently about how we get our message across and i think that's probably the one thing that i i'm looking forward to as a consumer but i'm terrified about as you know someone trying to navigate a brand through that kind of landscape you yeah. know what i mean yeah yeah i mean it, doing things the same way over and over again despite a changing environment it's yeah yeah i get it you know we we see it it's it's not just in the way that we try to sell products or market products either i'm sure you'll find you know that there's a lot of legacy thinking that makes its way even into the product development process right you know we we tend to struggle again as a consumer nobody ever goes oh man i wish they'd make the iphone 4 again you know what i mean nobody goes you know with very few occasions do people pine for the old the way that they seem to do when you talk to a certain slice of the tennis demographic and the tennis population right this idea that new isn't always better or it's sort of a, just a re-churning of the same story over and over and over again and i think as consumers we're starting to get numb to that and i think we're starting to wise up to say you know what same racket new paint job or you know iterative change is becoming less and less appealing to consumers now because we don't tolerate it in almost any other facet of our lives as consumers. So I'm actually kind of excited to see what that does in the next few years. I would love brands to start taking more risks. I mean, I certainly know that's how we're looking at the world um, from a product development perspective, but you know, it's um, risk is risk is risk. It's so always, in term, always a challenge. Yeah. So in terms of, in terms of trends, I mean, we're start. I think we're starting to see some bigger risks regarding some of the trends and, and maybe not risk might not be the best word for it, but we're starting to see some changes in, in, in some of the products, you know, especially, you know, the companies that were really well known for, you know, churning out really stiff, powerful rackets are yeah. starting to change that um, without calling anybody out in particular. I mean, sure. where do you see, where do you see things in five years in the, in the industry in terms of product? Without it's a good question. <laughs> too, too uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's obviously hard. No, nobody has a crystal ball. I, I do think you're right. I think that the industry trended so stiff for so long. Um, I think, you know, if you kind of track the history of the sport kind of decade by decade, the, there's only been a handful of really, let's call them technologies with any sense of permanence, right? That has really stuck around whether it be the wide body, the oversized, long body, um, those types of technologies that tend to, to stick around. W what I think is ultimately gonna happen is, I'm trying to articulate this in a way that it's not, I think we're gonna see a consolidation. I think we're gonna see less products less often, but in a more compelling way is what I think is going to happen. I, I think whether the market was going to be there now or whether I think this current situation is going to lead us there, I think this idea of churning out a brand new version of this collection of rackets every 18 to 24 months, I don't know that that's going to be sustainable anymore, right? The industry in a weird way is compounding a lot of its own problems. We're creating forced obsolescence when it comes to you know, frankly, product that has been really well thought out. I don't want to devalue the amount of work or effort that's gone into, I mean, even, even our products, right? We look at iterative change, whether it's even like the tour series, you know, we, it's not that there's no thought or consideration that goes into that product, but the expectation, you know, maybe, maybe five, 10 years ago, every 24 to 36 months, there were advancements that were happening. You could provide legitimate benefit and, you know, over a five to 10 year period, going back to the early 2000s, when I started between there and 2010, I think the market went through a wholesale change. You know, when I started, there was a very real chance if you didn't do your homework, you could walk away with a pretty crap racket. There was some clunkers in the market from every brand, right? Not every racket on the wall was, was a, a piece of art by any stretch. My God, we made more tennis rackets. I mean, you know, we didn't always get it right. But now, I mean, the truth is, everybody's really good at this. 
if you're if you're in the tennis industry, if you're Babylon or Wilson or Head or Prince, there's no such thing as a bad playing racket. Genuinely, nobody's doing a disservice to the industry. What I see though is there's a glut of choices, right? The question is why this racket versus this racket? How is this racket going to help me as a player go out and enjoy myself? And I think that and finding that connection, I think if we stripped everything down in these rackets, we took all the paint off them, took all the branding off of them, and we're somehow able to mask, you know, distinguishable features. And you laid out every racket from every brand on the, on, on the court and you did a massive demo day. I think you would find that generally speaking, you could probably service 85 to 90% of the market with four rackets. Yeah. And that's I mean, the truth. And that's the truth. Um, and I think the, the hard thing that all the brands are going to have to decide is they've got infrastructure in place to support 15 new rackets a year. Right. Um, but is the market going to continue to, to buy that product at the same clip? You know, I remember when I started the, the market data would suggest that consumers were looking to buy rackets between every two to three years, right? So every two to three years, you'd, you'd get a new racket. And I think since then, and I don't get the same data any more than I used to. So anybody watching this, if I misrepresent comment on, on an interesting, but I want to say that number is closer to every six to seven years now. So what, why is that? I mean, if I look at data like that, it just suggests that either we're not providing them a compelling reason to upgrade or we're creating the sort of forest obsolescence that says, hey, I can get a great value on last year's model and I can hang on to it for four years. And there's no real reason for me to, to buy new. So I think it's going to consolidate. Um, and then I think there's somebody, you know, I, I don't know who, could be us, um, could be another brand, but you know, I think Wilson did a great job with the clash. It's probably the first time like a new tech has really moved the market in a long time. And even as a competitor, I was actually encouraged to see that because, you know, one of the things that, that I fear as, you know, someone who's looking to develop and, and create product for people that really get out there and play is that there's some alarming trends in tennis. Uh, and one of them is you look at the overall economy of tennis it's kind of growing, flat to growing, present timeline excluded, because we don't know what the world looks like at the end of this. But in the last few years, you'd think like prize money's up, right? Ticket sales are up, TV ad revenue's up. All of the things related to spectatorship of tennis is up, right? Tennis is a consumable sport is up. Participation, not so much. Ball sales, flat to down, right? So the indicators of people who are actually playing versus watching, Right, so when you look, oh, the economy of tennis is up, but actually the people that really feed that industry from its base, those equipment sale numbers, anybody who's in this business will tell you have not been great the last few years. So we just have to find a way to keep those people really excited and really motivated and keep playing. Um, and that's what we gotta go to work to do every day. Well, I think, and I think that speaks to what you were talking about before about how everybody, everybody who's in the business now is, is for the most part knows how to make a good racket. Yeah. You know, and, sure. and that's the thing. There's, there's fewer people are coming onto the court, you know, uneducated or have a racket. Mm -hmm. That's an absolute piece of garbage where I know personally, I look at it and go, no, you need a, dif a different racket. You need a new racket. Yeah. Most of the time they show up with a racket. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. That'll totally work. That'll work. You yeah. Know? With, with, with the exception of, Hey, maybe it's a little too heavy. Maybe it's a little bit too light. light. You can, you can shift people, you know, you know, in a little bit one direction or the other, but this is where, you know, like what, what I do or what my team does versus what you do. My job's not to come in and make someone's forehand better, right. Or to change your forehand. My job is to make the forehand you have more effective, right? right. So from a racket manufacturer's point of view, I got to go in and assume that you're going to be the same player tomorrow that you are today. Right. My job is to fit the, the player you are now. How do I make, how do I maximize your game? Your job is to say, how do I get your game better? And then we get your equipment to match your game, right? And it's sort of that constant push and pull as to how you grow into, grow out of, and evolve your racket over your playing life that is interesting. That's why like the symbiotic relationship between coaches and manufacturing, I think is really interesting. And I don't know how much those two groups of people are connected enough to really make sure the product is going 
in the right direction, right? Yeah, I can, I can see that for sure, <laughs> for sure. Um, so changing gears a little bit, um, when you're thinking about your history, who are some of your favorite people you've had the opportunity to work with? You know, and again, this could be industry professionals, players, coaches, anybody. Who are some of your favorite people? Oh, man. Um, try to, I'll try to keep the list as brief as possible. It's, it's, I've been really fortunate. I've met a lot of pretty amazing people. Um, you know, my, my work family that, that got me started in the industry are, you know, relationships that I'll cherish forever. And that's, you know, the Peg Connors, the, the Ken Merritts and the Steve Davises of the world. Those, those three people, um, gave me every opportunity, put me on the right path, you know, kept me on that path. Um, and, and honestly, to, to this day, they're, you know, I'll, I'll cherish those relationships forever. Um, from an industry point of view, you know, there's, there's a couple, a couple people that have been uh, also really, really special to me. Um, I mean, the, the guys from, from Tennis Warehouse, um, Rick Kerbsack and Drew have been, have been an incredible group of guys to me. And really that, that whole team uh, over there, uh, the product team from Chris to Spencer, I mean, the whole, the whole crew to Michelle. I mean, I'm sure I'm going to leave somebody out, but, you know, you want to talk about a really passionate group of people that just absolutely love what they do. It's like, you know, I said before, like you get into kind of sharing people's happiness just to come back to it. Like when you meet another human being that loves product and tennis as much as you do, it's like, it's impossible to not have a good relationship with that person. Like if you genuinely love it for all the same reasons, it's, um, it's pretty spectacular. So they've been, they've been really great to work with. And then honestly, um, Jim, Jim Fromith, um, has, has been an amazing guy, um, to know over the years. Um, he, he's been somebody I've learned from and, um, you know, I'm always excited to see him every time I can. Um, so some of the players, um, I've, I've met quite a few. I don't know that I've had, you know, real deep intimate relationships with any of them. Obviously I've known John Isner for, for years. Um, great guy. Uh, it's been kind of cool to watch him and his career, um, since I've been with Prince. I mean, really, it's funny to think that he, his, almost his entire professional career almost lines up with my time at Prince. You know, he was, I think, um, maybe a year or two behind me in college. Um, so when I was starting at Prince, Kaylin Leslie, who was someone that was working with me, she took over the junior and college program after I moved into the product team. She took on the responsibility and was working with John Isner when he was um, transitioning out of his triple threat graphite mid plus into the O3 white for the first time. So Caitlin and I sat down and specked out along with Steve Davis, who helped guide me. But you know, part of my job when I was learning with Steve is I managed a lot of the pro stock gear. So Caitlin and I built out his grip size five, 27 and a half inch O3 white no weight except to match his original TT graphite mid plus. And that was it. He picked that racket up and played with it for the better part of what, 15 years now, it seems like. I had so, no idea that he started with a graphite mid plus. That's nuts. Yeah, what a change. TT, TT, TT graphite mid plus. His agent, Sam, actually sent me this video from him. I'll have to send it to you on my phone. It was somebody posted from like his high school or something on Twitter, this old, old like camcorder style video of John playing on some public court, you know, wherever. And enough, Sam's like, what racket is that? I'm like, dude, I know exactly what racket that is. That is the triple third grab by mid plus 27 and a half inches. Just a bean wow. pole, man. Just, wow. he's just all just legs and arms that dude back then. It's crazy. I'll send you, I'll send you the, the link. When that's we're, when we're off the call i'm I'm just like baffled by that equipment yeah. change i mean that's going from something thin to the o3 white i mean that's wild yeah, yeah. That's wild. i mean the other thing that's been pretty cool um for me is a big part of my job is one of the things that i've, I've genuinely loved over the years i've done quite a bit of traveling so yeah i've met a lot of really incredible people like kind of around the world 
um, our, our team that manages our sourcing operation in, in Taiwan, um, that whole team, they're like my, they're like my Asian family. You know what I mean? I've got like my Asian, like my, my Taiwanese dad and my Taiwanese mom. Like I've been, <laughs> I feel like I've been working with them since I was a kid. Um, and they've been there, you know, for me every step of the way and continue to be as diehard an advocate for this brand as, as you could possibly hope for. So, I mean, and there's dozens of other people um, from every country around the world that I've had the pleasure of getting to know and you know work with over the past what I started in 2015. Yeah, 15 years, 15 years wow. this year. So would you say that John Isner is the Tyler Herring of the ATP tour? Is that fair? <laughs> Not even close. Not even close. I wouldn't even know where to begin with that. <laughs> so uh, speaking, speaking of some of these people, um, let's go into your favorite players. Now, this is more, this is more as, as a fan, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Fan of the sport. Favorite players current and favorite players all time. Yeah, Men all time is a no-brainer. Andre Agassi's the reason that I, yeah, I mean Agassi's was my dude. Like I've, um, I've had on on two occasions. I don't. I've I've met a lot of players over the years, and I rarely get like kind of starstruck. I've met Andre on two occasions. I could barely speak. Um, <laughs> it's just that dude. Something about his energy, just his whole vibe. Like I like the way he played. Um, everything about him was his part. He's the reason that I'm in tennis to a degree. Um, so from, from that era, uh, love that. I always was a fan of um, Marcelo Rios as well. I don't know why I just love the way that dude hit the ball. Um, and then for uh, also in my, my, probably in my top five, Pat Rafter was also like, I played the, 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 the racket, the, um, uh, what was it? I'm gonna. What the TT Warrior? Precision, the what precision response? response, the yeah. precision response 660 um, before the TI, the dark red one was yep. um, when I started playing in high school. I started with this snowshoe print synergy extender because I didn't know any better. And I gradually, as I started to go to like camps and stuff, a buddy of mine like put this racket in my hand and that was it for me. Like, I feel like me picking up that center the precision response 660 is when i went from being just like a kid who got dragged on to try and out for tennis to playing one singles like that was the racket that took me there so i don't know if i just connect that with pat rafter at the time but i've always that uh, chip and charge serving volley i mean i love that um love that um today my favorite player this is tough i mean i don't want to give a bunch of cliche answers i mean the amount of admiration for the the Fed and Nadal is goes without saying. Um, it's weird. I I look at players now more. It's like I like aspects of certain people's game. You know what I mean? Like I love teams backhand more than anything on tour right now. I just he freaking swings at that thing with the reckless abandon that it's hard to because it's both sturdy and strong. But he just it's not like Warinka's, which is fluid but almost I don't want to say it's stiffer because that's not even the right phrase I don't know there's just something about team's backhand that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up but there's one dude honestly there's only one guy on tour right now that I feel like if, with the right matchup it's destination like I would stop what I'm doing to go watch and it's curious wow I actually I I think he's a crazy guy right I I I know he rubs a lot of people the wrong way. I don't condone a lot of the things that he does both on and off the court, you know, but I actually think he's, we need more people like him in the sport genuinely because he's, he just brings a flair. He's fun to watch. He's fun to watch. And he's one of the best pure ball strikers that the sport has seen in a really long time. I mean, he's just one of those guys that just, you just pick up a racket and he hits the ball clean every time. Just incredible. Like I liken it to uh, the only guy that I saw in person um, who I saw quite a bit because we were based out of IMG a lot. We had a relationship with the IMG Kevin was Xavier Melise. So when he was 
kind of in his prime. Um, he used to train down at IMG. That dude, if I don't know what held him back up here, but on the practice court and just from a pure ball striking, I mean, that guy was the cleanest, purest striker of a tennis ball that I've ever seen in person by a mile, by a mile. And I've seen quite a bit of people play tennis. Um, he could just do anything with the ball whenever he wanted. And he played some stupid Centronic Brio string, this literally this garbage synthetic gut strung at like 70 pounds on his Diablo mid plus 28. I mean, just like, you couldn't even imagine that he did stuff with the ball with the setup that he had. It's just, it's unbelievable. Yeah. That's that, that's that like mid nineties to late nineties kind of setup, right? It's that yeah, man, it, it was, it was racket, incredible. Not a ton of weight, super whippy, um, you know, full 28 inch and you know, with, he had that kind of yeah. split hand on his backhand. He just never missed. I mean, it was incredible, incredible. Um, speaking as a fan again. Yeah. What's your favorite tournament or event? Um, it's a no-brainer for me. It's Indian Wells. Um, Indian Wells is the best event as a spectator, as an industry person. The venue is unbelievable. Um, the temperatures, the, the, like, the weather's great. The venue's great. It's men's and women's. The practice courts are super accessible. There's a retail booth with a court. Like you get to go check out all the gear. Um, the hospitality, like the food and drink is, is really, really good. Um, like if I could go to one event for the rest of my life, that would be it. I've not been to Australia. I heard Australia is, is right up there in terms of fan favorites, although it's a thousand degrees during the Australian Open, which is not my cup of tea personally. Well, it'll take a little longer to get there too. So yeah, exactly. That too. Exactly. Um, what would you say your favorite all time gear is? So again, let's go same thing. Let's go all time and let's go current favorite gear. Favorite gear. Well, I mean, that's okay honestly, from a racket, I, I got to go back to my precision response. Yeah. Like for real, like that's a racket that every, you know, there's just, you have those rackets and when you pick it up, you just feel like you're home. Mm -hmm. Like that racket to me, like the way it sits in my hand, it's the racket that I learned to play. Why well, I switched from a two hander to a one hander. So like that muscle memory of how that racket sits, the shape of the cross section, how it sits in my left hand and the throat just feels, cause that's, I remember just shadow swinging and like, that's just what I remember. So when I pick that racket up, I, I feel immediately connected to it. Um, with optic yellow print synthetic gut with Duraflex. Yeah. Without sure. question. That's Classic. the setup. That's the setup. Um, Optic yellow thought, always played better than the white. It was oh, the best synthetic on the, on the market. And then, so I was, I did that up with the leather grip as well. And I put a Turner grip. So that was sort of my, my setup when I was playing, um, of the newest gear. Um, man, there's been so much stuff that I've liked, um, recently. If I had to go pick up and play a set right now, with any of the, the newest product. Um, honestly, I'd probably pick up the Beast 98 for me. I think that racket is such a sleeper. I mean, we'll talk product development. I think that's a racket that just didn't really get nearly enough respect or trial. It just kind of, because as I've gotten older, I want to gravitate towards like a Beast, Pure Drive, that kind of a stick with a little bit more power but I just never really liked the stiffness of it. I just feel like I couldn't feel the ball and it just got squirrely on me. Like I just, I liked it for certain shots, but I just felt like it just lacked control. And when I moved into like the tour, I played the tour, um, tour 100, the 310 gram for, for a while, which I also loved, but I felt like it needed a little bit more juice and it got a little heavy for me. So that piece 98 at 305 grams was like, perfect for me um what else i mean my other favorite gear my favorite shoes of all time if you remember um the nike um i think it was called the zoom internationals i think they were called they were the black and white and on the outside they had this like orange zigzag 
they were they were one of the oh my god the zoom air zoom internationals i have to pull them up but those to this day were the best shoes i've I ever wore i've always been a nike shoe guy so i've got tech challenges coming out the wazoo in my closet back there i still rock those bad boys what uh God, I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> what, <laughs> what would you say is your favorite product that, that you've played a part in developing? Oh, my God. I feel like I should have prepared for this question. <laughs> um, there's been quite a few. Um, I know. It's like, yeah. which, which kid is your favorite? Yeah, it's it, it is true. I, and and to be to be truthfully like to be perfectly honest, it's it's hard it's a hard question for me to ask because there's been very few products that, you know, if you're if you're in the product development business, you realize that, you know, you don't you don't work alone, right? So, I've had the 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 real fortune of working with some really really talented engineers and, and product developers. So, my part in the role has never been as much on the engineering side as it has been on identifying the right objective, right? Like what's the market want? Like what, what is the consumer that we're going after? And then how do we innovate around delivering that solution? Um, so from a racket point of view, uh, I don't know that I can point to one that's, and the reason I'm hesitating is not because I can't think of any, is that I don't want to take any unnecessary credit. I think the new Phantom series from top to bottom is probably the one line of rackets that I feel the most proud about. Um, and that's, you know, I don't want to take credit for the design, you know, you know, all credit to, to Tim Puttick and, and, uh, and, and Ramon who kind of from my team that, that really from the get visualized and conceptualized the, the technical aspects to that frame. But what I like about that racket that, that I feel connected with is we were in kind of a downturn with the brand. The brand had gone through a bunch of a bunch of ups and downs, and we had this kind of weird moment of freedom where, as a group, we were a small, passionate group of people. We didn't have the big company corporate oversight telling us what we had to make, what it needed to be, what the price. You know, we didn't have that sort of heavy sales influence that a lot of times product development is, you know, pressured to to follow right, is, oh, we need a racket that's this price and this color and, and 300 grams. And that's because that's what's selling. And we said, listen, if we can make any racket and it was us and this was our brand and we could do anything we wanted to do, what would we do and why? And it came on the back of us really doing a lot of self-reflection on why the brand had lost some of its swagger, right? And why we lost some of our, our fans, why we lost some of our, our market share. And when we really did a deep dive and took a good hard look in the mirror, we realized that, you know, our competitors had never really strayed that far from their roots. And they'd always provided a solution that that spoke to their their origin story, right? Whether that's, you know, Babolat and the Pure Drive, whether it's Wilson and the Pro Staff, whether when I think of head, I think of the prestige or the radical, that sort of 1820, right, was always heads thing. And you know, what was Princess Thing? I mean, Princess Thing was thinner beam, rounder head, open pattern. You think about the the Guillermo Coria's, the Michael Chang's, the Juan Carlos Ferrer. Like when you think about Prince in the Pantheon and all of the, the athletes and the players who've ever played this brand, and you think about, they all played a weirdly similar style or, or benefited from a very unique signature style of Prince racket, which was the rounder head, open string pattern. Um, and, and thinner beam, right? Prince was never really known um, for making real wide or thick rackets. So when we look back and said, okay, we just gone through this round of TechStream 1, our first generation of TechStream product. And we kind of sat back and said, okay, let's go back. Let's, let's, let's build, if we could start this brand over, knowing what we know about it now, using technology in a way that's not been used, we looked at the shape, the cross section combined with the technology and sort of all of those things came together in sort of one product line, a few different models, but one product story. And to be fair, without a lot of push and without a lot of heavy marketing, that front racket line has become the best selling product line that we make today. 
And I think it's because it has its own identity. It feels like a Prince racket. It, you know, it plays like a Prince racket. It's, it's, it feels like the first truly Prince branded product that we've made probably in quite a few years. You know, we had gotten really focused on trying to make our version of other people's best product, right? And I think everybody's done that to a degree. I don't think that's a unique problem from Prince, but when you do that, you never come up with anything new, right? Because rackets can only be 24 to 26 millimeters. They can only be a 1619. They can only be between 280 and 305 grams. Like if you look at the market now, 90% of the product you could put within a 10% plus or minus from a standard spec. And the Phantom didn't do that, right? And that's why it feels maybe more special to me than anything else we've done. That almost sounds like life advice. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not life advice. It's just, you know, the lesson learned there was when, when you have a moment and, you know, you don't have the pressure, um, you know, sometimes the best decisions come out of moments like that, right? Even if you have to artificially do it, even if you have to hypothetically you know, have some of those conversations. It was the first time in a while that we had stopped chasing and we started leading, right? In our minds, right? Like, what would we do? This isn't about what they're doing. This isn't about what our competition is doing. This isn't about, you know, because what we fall into as a trap as product developers a lot is, you know, because the game that we're all trying to play is, Mitch, you play racket A, right? How do I get you to buy a Prince racket, right? So the first thing you do is, okay, well, I'm going to make a better mousetrap. You're playing a, a pure drive, right? So I'm going to make a hundred square inch, 24 to 26 millimeter, 16, 19, 70 RA, but I'm going to do this too, right? And the problem is you're making assumptions about that customer. You're making an assumption that they're using the right racket, number one. Number two, that there isn't something that they wish they could get out of that racket that that racket's not currently doing. You know, very rarely do we find a racket that solves 100% of our needs, right? If you're looking at a checklist of 10 things, I think if probably most people have checked five of those boxes who are not really doing the research and demoing. People who are better than most are probably checking seven of those boxes. And like, you know, the top 1% of talk tennis racket nerds are probably checking nine out of 10 boxes, but I don't know that anybody's checking 10 out of 10. And as developers, we assume that you have, right? When we're trying to convince you to put down your brand of product and pick up our brand. And therefore, if everybody's developing that way, what do you end up with? You end up with essentially six versions of the Blade 98, six versions of the Pure Drive, you know, go down the list, right? Everybody has their own versions of everybody else's stuff because I'm trying to encourage you to switch brands. Instead of saying, you know what? I'm going to make a phantom. The hardest thing when you walk into a room of sales reps is to go, here's a new racket. And they go, well, what does it play like? And you go, nothing. There is no equivalent in the market to this product. And they go, well, then what are you doing? Because how do we know that we're, well, we don't, right? You don't know. So it's a bit of a leap of faith, which is the scary part. But like I said, I think we, we had the opportunity. We took it and I'm glad we did on this one. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, a lot of, a lot of good stuff we talked about today. Let me talk about some silly stuff. Yeah. Silly. Okay. Favorite movie of all time. Top Gun. Or, or, mo or movies because I can't, I can't just do one. So oh, I know it's so hard. Um, I mean, Top Gun has a special place in my heart for whatever reason. Um, love that movie. Um, what else? I mean, we'd have to go like genre by genre. I mean, there's so many options. You got to, you play two, you start and I'll come back on top. Oh God. Uh, I think formative, formative years for me is Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, I'm trying to think more modern. Um, I'm like way more into series right now. Like, can I tell you like my, yeah. my obsession right now is yeah. Ozark. Ozark. From Netflix, Jason Great Bateman. Show. Great show. I mean, it's it's beautiful. It's such a great show. Um, 
like Jason Bateman's one of my new favorite act. Just his his performance in that show, and Laura Linney's amazing as well. So I've been obsessed with that show. Um, just finished okay. season three. So you're caught up then. I'm totally caught up. Yeah. yeah, totally caught up. So no spoilers. No so spoilers. How how many days did it take for you to finish season three? Not many. <laughs> Not many. I think um, when it released on a Friday, right? Yeah. Yeah, the 27th, um, I think. I think I, because I, I'm not a fan or anything. Um, yeah, I think I finished it before the weekend was up. Yeah, I think I did too. Yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Great, great series. All right, and last, and last thing. I did this to Dennis too. Uh-oh. Favorite musical group? Favorite All musical time. group? All time and Zeppelin. Current. Zeppelin. Zeppelin. I literally, I made my five-year-old sit down and watch a live performance of Zeppelin two days ago. That's awesome. I made him do it. No, because he loves, my, my oldest is like crazy into music and he's got like, he's very eclectic. Like he likes a lot of things for a five-year-old, but he recently, I exposed him um, while driving to the grocery store before the craziness hit. I had on my playlist and Rage Against the Machine came on, Testify his favorite song of all time like awesome. like sits in the back in his seat and you know jams out so i slowly started introducing him to more like 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 heavy guitar type of type of music and now we listen to led zeppelin a lot <laughs> that's awesome a lot that's awesome very so. i'm very happy that you're doing your part as a good citizen of rock and roll i'm trying man fostering trying. the next generation I'm trying that's great well, Tyler, thanks so much for taking the time yeah, no to chat with me today. I really appreciate it. And um, I've hit with some of the new print sticks. And I have to say, even though um, I'm playing with different sticks currently, um, okay. I'm, I'm a big it's fan. A I'm a big fan of, of especially that Phantom 97P. So I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, for, uh, thanks for doing this. This has been fun. Obviously, it's, it's been a blast. Glad that we got a chance to, to catch up. It's been a little while. Um, but yeah, anytime. I'm happy to happy to jump on. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. Hopefully we'll right. see you at see you at the US Open again this year. In Palm Springs, where it's gonna be. <laughs> Wherever it is. Right. Awesome. All right. Thanks again. Be safe. Yeah, you too. All Appreciate right. it. Thanks, Tyler. Bye bye.